Introduction. Today, Sunday, February 9th, I was skiing down the back with our dogs. By skiing along the old riverbed, I have been able to get around the huge piles of snow dumped by the city. While going this way, I am able to look up at the old river bank that forms the north boundary of all the lots on Western Street. I realize that I am looking at a landscape not very different from that seen by Augustus Jones when he surveyed the river in January and February 1793. Probably the view from the flats is not that different in some respects to what it was when there was an Iroquois camp some hundreds of years ago at the intersection of Foxbar Creek and the Old River Bed. In the woods at the foot of the Old River Bed, there are the mounds of incinerator ash from Victoria Hospital medical waste that May Abrams walked through when she was a child in the 1920s. She has told me how frightening it was to walk through the still smoldering piles at night. As I skied further east, I tried to visualize the fields of the vegetables and flowers that the Bartlett family grew on the flats in the 1860s. I passed the old road that is still used as a path from Weston Street to the river. This is the road that Ernie Potter talks about that was used by the gardeners to get their produce up the hill. On the top of the hill, they had orchards. I thought about the Moravians rafting back to Moravian town along here as they headed back to their ruined village in 1814. It had been burned by the Americans in the aftermath of the Battle of Moravian Town. As I look around, my mind is filled with images of people and things who have occupied this area, and I can see the landscape, which consists of willows, frozen ponds, and a steep hillside with backyards along the top. The earth moves enough to disrupt surveyor's stakes. That is, it moves in detail, but stays the same in its overall appearance. Because the area behind us is wild and overgrown, it is timeless. But there is the story of the retired British Army engineer, General William Renwick, who owned in the 1870s what was called the tongue of land that extended south from what is now Nelson Street. At that time, the river still curved south so that the water's edge formed the north boundary of our lot. What remains now is a series of long ponds. Actually, they are identical to the coves, only smaller, because the general caused the river to change its course. Apparently, he dug a ditch across the tongue of land about where the river flows now. When the great flood of July 1883 struck, it gouged out a new channel where the general's ditch was. In doing so, it did a lot of damage to Henry Winnett's house, which was on high land at the east end of Front Street, in addition to destroying four new cottages and washing away six acres of land on the river flats. General Renwick lost an expensive lawsuit for damages to win its property. Yesterday, February 8th, do the dogs were barking at a man and a boy who were getting water from an open spot in the old river in a blue plastic drum. They were using it to flood the frozen section east of us. They are doing what generations of residents of Western Street have done, exploring the woods down the back, skating on the frozen river bed, making dugouts and shacks, and so on. The street and its goings-on are probably typical of areas of the city near the river. My sons, Owen and Galen and Mark Favreau, made a terrific video of an explosion of fireworks in one of the four-foot-high concrete storm sewer pipes down the back. There is this brilliant rolling ball of fire with smoke coming out of the pipe. Owen was talked out of shooting it from the inside. A few years ago, someone built a birdwatching blind on a small island in the old riverbed just east of us. My kids saw the birdwatcher occasionally. I can remember when they were digging the foundation for the Harper's house next door last summer, seeing the layers of rubble, then the sandy topsoil profile of the original riverbank and the light gray clay below that. That was my first realization of what we actually live on. Today, Wednesday, February 12th, I examined the flats more carefully and realized that the river seems to have curved south about 200 meters west of the LMPS railway bridge before the flood of 1883. And the old river bank is at its highest directly behind our place where the river began to curve north again. It's possible General Renwick dug an irrigation ditch for the fertile river flats that he owned. It can be very dry along the river in the summer. Around 1500, the population within the present city limits of London, Ontario, was 5,000. 
Three years before John Cabot saw Newfoundland, the neutral nation lived in four towns around what is now London. They lived here for about 100 years. The term Atawanderon, which has been used to describe this nation, is a word the Hurons used to describe the neutrals after they had left this area and moved to the west end of Lake Ontario around 1550. It was there that they came into contact with Europeans. French couriers Dubois and priests. The priests compiled a dictionary of the neutral language which has been lost. As a result, we do not know what they call themselves. Recently, a convent in Montreal, which had been closed for many years, has been opened to scholars. Huron girls were educated here, and consequently it is a repository for early records of French-Indian contact in New France. An inventory is being made of its holdings, and the hope is being held out that the dictionary of neutral terms may be found there. Darrell Stonefish, Moravian town historian, told me on February 7th that descendants of the neutral nations survive on the Six Nations Reserve to this day. Human occupation of this area goes back much earlier to the Paleo-Indian sites of pond mills on the Ingersoll Moraine. Tonight, Saturday, February 15th, Neil Ferris told me more about Bob Calvert's discovery around 1947 of pottery fragments and other artifacts from a middle Ontario Iroquois site where Foxbar Creek joins the old bed of the river. The site is about 300 meters from our house behind the Moose Lodge at 6 Western Street. Other nations occupied this area after the neutrals with the present Ojibwa occupants arriving about 1690. On June 22, 1790, at L'Assomption, now Windsor, in the district of Hess, seven Ojibwa, 13 Wyandot, eight Odawa, and six Potawatomi chiefs drew their totems on surrender number two. They received 1,200 worth of goods in Quebec currency for surrendering all of southwestern Ontario south of the Askunesipi As Thames River or Riviere à la Tranchée to the Crown, King George III. Surrender number two had, as its eastern limit, a line drawn from near Dorchester on the Aska, Mississippi, south to Catfish Creek, Riviere de Chaudière, at Port Bruce on Lake Erie. When I read a copy of that document, I began to be aware of spheres of influence that operated in this area in 1790. They survive today. It is a long distance call from London to Putnam, which is 25 kilometers. It is not a long distance call from London to Glencoe, which is 50 kilometers. Our telephone areas have something to do with our country system, county system, which itself is related to the boundaries of the various surrenders. They are related to the areas of occupation of the various First Nations in southern Ontario from around 1783 to 1820. In 1784, a tract of land was purchased from the Mississauga Ojibwa by the Crown. Its western limit was a line drawn north from Catfish Creek at Port Bruce to the Thames River near Dorchester. On December 7, 1792, at Navy Hall, which is Niagara-on-the-Lake, in Lincoln County, surrender number three formalized the sale of 1784 with the drawn totems of five Mississauga Ojibwa chiefs who lived near Lake Ontario. Much of this transaction was to secure lands for several Iroquois nations who had supported the British during the American Revolution. They emigrated to Canada as a result of their allegiance to the Crown. The two Delaware divisions, Munsee and Unami, who arrived around the same time seemed to exist outside of these boundaries. They moved freely between the Delaware communities on the Grand River, on the Thames River at Muncie, and on the Lower Thames in Moravian Town. In talking to local historians about the period prior to European settlement, it is common to be told, I know nothing about this. We live in a culture where pre-existing cultures lived and live. They have survived in isolation from the culture of the City of London, both within the city and in areas of original settlement that date back to around 1690, 15 miles away. They have been omitted from most books of local history. 
the usual practice is to include a summary of 10,000 years of human occupation on the first couple of pages as a prelude to the arrival of European explorers and settlers. I am discovering incidents of a coincidental or personal nature that are really astonishing. John Simon, 1900 to 1965, horseshoe champion from the Muncie Ojibwe Reserve, played at the Western Street Horseshoe Club. According to Ernie Potter, he could throw ringers when the pit was covered with a blanket. Their field, lit with rows of electric lights, was located on the east side of our place on Western Street until about 1940. It was a member of that club who discovered the big fire that destroyed the second floor of our building in August 1937. John Simon Sr. signed Surrender Number 126, which gave a right-of-way to the Canada Southern Railway in 1872. His father, or grandfather, Old Simon, fought alongside Tecumseh at the Battle of Moravian Town in 1813. The Simon family seems to have been on the St. Clair River before that. John Askin, clerk of the District Court and clerk of the peace in London in the 1830s and after, was a son of John Askin Jr. and a woman from the Indian country west of Detroit. Some sources state that she was an Indian woman. Others state that she was a white captive. His grandmother was Manette, or Monette, an Indian slave. John Askin was one quarter European. Askin Street is named after him. Cynthia Street and Teresa Street are named after his daughters. Poet Colleen Thibodeau's great-great-grandmother, Margaret Middow, 1803 to 1870, lived on a farm near Moravian Town. Family history says that she met Tecumseh as a child. On October 5th, 1813, the Battle of Moravian Town took place beside her parents' farm. American soldiers showed her what they said was Tecumseh's head on a split rail after the battle. Margaret's future husband, Pierre Thibodeau, 1785 to 1850, was a prisoner of war and guide with the U.S. forces who escaped and fought on the British side at the Battle of Moravian Town. A member of the Kettle Point Ojibwa community has in his possession a George III medal that is said to have been Tecumseh's. Labatt Park used to be called Tecumseh Park. South Central London, where we live, was developed as a residential and light industrial area where proprietors could live close to their plants. Our building was built in 1891 by Thomas Knowles Sr., 1841 to 1926, an immigrant from England who had lived on Western Street since 1873 as a lithography shop for his sons, Thomas, 1866 to 1933, and Joseph Knowles, 1868 to 1954. London artist Albert Templer apprenticed here in 1917. He ground litho stones as part of his apprenticeship. He boarded on Maryborough Place, now McClary Ave. My son Galen and I have dug up Knowles Company litho stones from the back of our building. My most recent prints were three editions of lithographs drawn directly on litho stones. The lithographer owners who worked here were well connected socially to the extent of belonging to the exclusive Forest City Bicycle Club around that time with the then famous Arthur Stringer and the Saunders family of the Saunders Drug Company. The club rode ordinaries and safety bicycles. The Knowles brothers rode their bicycles from 38 Western Street to their club rides. I leave from the same place for club rides with the London Centennial Wheelers. I phoned the United Church Archives in Toronto for information on Reverend Leonard Bartlett, who was born next door. They sent me back a mimeographed biography. Although it was unsigned, I suspect it was written by my late friend and Reverend Robert Cumming. He gave me copies of several biographies of ministers from the area that he was writing about 20 years ago. They were also mimeographed with the same typeface, titles, and layout. Leonard Bartlett was a Sunday school superintendent of the High Street Mission, which later became Calvary United Church. By the early 18th century, when the Petit Cote settlement was founded, Canada's historic equation was in place. It operates to this day in our constitutional discussions and led a few years ago to the end of the Meech Lake Accord. 
the struggle between the native nations that moved and shifted around southwestern Ontario, the French and the English in the 18th century district of Hesse, is not very different from the situation today, and the revival of the political power of Canada's First Nations is bringing us much closer to the original historic relationship of Canada's constitu constituent cultures. My primary information on native cultures has come from Delbert Riley, chief of the Chippewa of the Thames, Ken Labert, Mrs. Albert, Doris Fisher, and Sylvester Simon from the same nation as Muncie, at Muncie, Roberta Miskamon for information for, of the Muncie nation, Jim Bob and Margaret Jackson for information on the Ojibwa language, and Ray John for information on the Oneida language. Gord Chris John from the Oneida Settlement, Daryl Stonefish and Diane Snake of the Delaware Nation at Moravian Town, Dean Jacobs of Walpole Island, Tom Hill and Phil Montier at Six Nations, and Colleen Thibodeau and her sister Sheila Lambrinos. My discussions with Del Riley began about 20 years ago when our mutual friend Murray Favreau brought him to visit at 38 Western Street. Michael Spence initiated my education into the archaeological riches of this area when he patiently answered my questions about visual art from the Paleo-Indian period. Neil Ferris and Robert Pierce have also answered a lot of my questions. For the period after the surrenders, I have received a lot of assistance from Dick Kirkpatrick and Charles Chapman, Ontario Land Surveyors. I used to work for them in the Surveys Department of the City of London. Surveyors Don Redmond, Brad Holstead, Murray Fraser and Jack Webster have all been very helpful. Joanne Scott has been of great assistance in property searches at the registry office and Linda Davy has given me many insights into the legal aspects of deeds, mortgages and family law. With the help of Glenn Curnow, Ed Phelps, Dan Brock, Guy Saint-Denis, Theresa Regener, the Reverend Greg Smith and many others, I continued my research into deeds, abstracts, church records, cemetery records, census returns, assessment rolls, and so on. I began to notice another invisible element in our society. Local histories have tended to be about prominent families and public figures. I began to gather information about other families, uncommented on except as statistics or entries in ledgers. I was amazed to find how little was known about the era, area I live in. I found also that a 1905 London and Middlesex Historical Society paper by Harriet Priddis, The Naming of London Streets, contained inaccuracies about street names in my area, and I couldn't find the name of various physical features of this area of the city. I couldn't find the name of the now tiled creek at the foot of our street for a long time. It is called Foxbar Creek. And still can't find the origin of the name. My brother, Glenn Curnow, librarian of the London Room at the London Public Library, has been constantly giving me information and connections about these more local features, as has my mother, Nellie Porter Curnow. It became clear, as Sheila and I talked to Mark Gladys, the heritage planner for the city, that designation of historical buildings in London has had a lot to do with the social status of the former occupants and until recently little to do with the intrinsic value of the buildings to be designated. For this reason, London has lost most of its 19th century industrial architecture and areas like South London, West London and East London are drastically underrepresented in this city's inventory of historical buildings. He clearly wishes to help change this. Apparently, Manor Park contains no buildings of historical importance in spite of the existence of the large and handsome 19th century home of the notorious Murrell family there. These attitudes in London are infectious. The day after the charges against the London Art and Historical Museums for practicing archaeology without a license under the Ontario Heritage Act were dismissed, they had destroyed the remains of London's earliest Euro-Canadian street to build a vault to store historical collections. Lutus showed up at the Dundurn Castle archaeological site in Hamilton. They told archaeologist Linda Gibbs that they had a right to loot the site because the London decision proved that the Heritage Act no longer applied to them. 
What is being discussed here is not history so much as the underpinnings of our culture. We need to know that the area contained within London's current city limits had a population of around 5,000 in 1500. It didn't start with Governor Simcoe naming the Forks London. We have only a warped and exclusive view of our culture if we insist on naming in a way that isn't really connected to what is being named. This is part of the problem with the use of social status as the main criterion for determining historical importance. Continuing to name in imitation of London, England is alienating. Partridge says that London comes from Lond, a Celtic term meaning wild, bold, powerful, irascible. The Forks was the term for this immediate area before London was established. It has continued to be used in a more limited sense. Partridge also says that Thames derived from the Old English Thames, meaning the Dark River. The name Askenesipi is far more descriptive of our river. It comes from Eshkan, Ojibwe for antlered, and Zibi, Ojibwe for river. Eskin Zibi therefore means antlered river after its many creeks and branches. La Riviere à la Tranchée, Wabuno, Echo Bridge, Meadow Lily Road, The Coves, Cove Road, Beechwood Place, Elmwood Ave, Winery Hill, Brick Street, part of Commissioner's Road, named after the many brickworks there, Riverview Ave, Reservoir Hill, Baseline Road, the baseline of Simon Zelot's Watson's survey of Westminster Township in 1810, Front Street, the broken front of Watson's survey, Rectory Street, Pond Mills, and Riverview Heights, all named after physical features around London, carry a lot of meaning in their names. The same is true of streets and features named after local inhabitants. Askin Street, Weston Street, William Weston, 1799 to 1871, British Army veteran, Tanner, Courier, Market Gardener, and Anna Weston, 1799 to 1852, Tecumseh Public School, Tecumseh Ave. Wetter Avenue, Richard Wetter, Farmer. Frank Place and Frank Mount, the Frank family. Clark's or Wellington Bridge, Reverend William Clark, 1801 to 1878. London's first congregation, Congregationalist minister. Watson Street, George Watson, 1812 to 1909, carpenter and architect. Colgrove Place, Robert Colgrove, 1834 to 1893, market gardener. Sumner Road, the Sumner family of farmers, commissioners road, and so on. London's black community in the 19th century did not support the rebellion of 1837 because many of its members were refugees from slavery in the U.S., and they knew what American freedom meant for them. Around this time, members of the black community were stationed at railway stations, and when they would see an American with his slave, they would telegraph ahead to the next stop where the slave was taken from the owner. Upper Canada was one of the first jurisdictions anywhere to abolish slavery, gradually in 1793. It was finally outlawed in the British Empire in 1834. Alan Cohen has told me that London had a substantial Jewish anarchist community located around Gray and Waterloo Streets. It brought Emma Goldman here to lecture in the 1930s. A few years later, part of the Jewish community was concentrated in the area around Frank Place, southwest of Western Street, across Wellington Road. Hyman Ginsberg and an architect who was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright designed and built a classic modernist house beside Frank Mount the Frank family homestead, on Wellington Crescent in the 1940s. The waves of immigration from Europe and increasingly Asia continue. Western Street experienced a continuous flow of immigrants from the British Isles from its beginnings in 1840 until the 1930s. In the 1950s, people from continental Europe began to settle on the street, including people from Germany, Italy, Malta, Latvia and Holland. In the 1960s, families from Russia and Jamaica moved onto the street. Our neighbors, the Kintings, across the street first rented a house on Western Street in the early 1960s because it felt like a United Nations street and they felt at home. 
At the same time, Weston Street has held onto many of its earlier residents. It is not uncommon for people to have lived here for over 50 years. Much of the oral history I have obtained has come from Ernie Potter, who has lived on the street since 1920. Mr. and Mrs. McCone, who have lived here since the 1920s, May Abrams, who lived on Weston Street from 1925 to 91, and her husband, Walter, who lived here from 1946 to 1991. The late Albert Knowles, who owned and worked at 38 Weston from 1943 until 1960. His son-in-law, Ken Smith, Albert Templer, who apprenticed at 38 Weston Street in 1917, Hans and Monica Holtzel, who have lived here since 1953, and Eddie Pranskas, who was brought up on Weston Street in the 1950s. Many others in the neighborhood have been of great assistance. Today, Thursday, March 26, I was talking to Bill Sabo, who lives on the south side of Weston Street beside Foxbar Creek. He has lived on Weston Street all his life. We walked to the back of his yard and we tried to see if there were many, any remnants of a lane from the old frame house on Wellington Road to the back of the lots on Weston Street. Bill told me that the frame house was one of the oldest in the area. It has a red brick foundation and could be the Weston homestead or the house built by George and Anna June Adelaide Weston. Could there be a log house under the frame siding? His older brother remembers the open creek and the bridge over it on Weston Street. The question of the power of histories of broad conclusions and great events in contrast to histories of details has occurred to me as I am writing this. I have felt the power of many details adding up to an understanding of the ground I am standing on. It is an understanding that is new to me, in spite of the fact that I have worked with this kind of information for years. Greg Curnow, 1st February to March 26, 1992.